this is a special place to me. Always will be. Um, forever. Um, I see Mr. Mazellan out there. We started here. We started here. Uh, got married here. You know, this is our home. This will always be special to me. I actually went to Iraq and flew a flag for uh, the church. And um, used to be out by the bathroom. I don't know if it is anymore. I went back there the last time. I couldn't find it. But it's, it's actually a pretty cool flag. Um, I appreciate everything that um, Humphreys and the team uh, does um, in the community with um, addiction. Um, just a place for people to come and, you know, lean on each other. You know, every single person in here has been on some kind of journey. And it's, uh, it's awesome um, to have that support from each other. Let's just pray real quick. Father, to be with the speaker, make everything that you've been giving me and downloading in me and waking me up in the night to um, communicate it clearly. I got six pages of notes up here. And uh, a lot of it is totally different. So um, I don't know if it's for different people or whatnot, but I just prepare their heart, God, um, not to receive on a surface level where they're um, pretty on the outside, but dying on the inside. God, let it go deep. Mm -hmm. Let it go deep down mm -hmm. to the root and destroy it. Mm -hmm. yes. Good ground. Mm -hmm. To restore them to what you called them to be. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 First and foremost, a lot of these get a lot of um, buzz about uh, upbringing and um, as a kid I was spoiled so never do I want anyone to think any of this meant that uh, they were bad parents um, I love my mom I love my dad they did their very best with um what they had when they had it. Um, and I'll honor them and love them with all my heart. So let's just get that in the brain housing group because uh, some of this is it's just the truth. Um, and it seems like I'm bashing them and I'm not. <sighs> when I first started reading the Bible, uh, Satan comes to kill, soul, and destroy jumped off the page of me um, because I did all of those things. So immediately I felt like I'm on the wrong team. <clears throat> so I wasn't raised in church. Yearly, maybe, Easter, you know, really wasn't. Um, no, no real knowledge, you know, we had a song on the way to church, and that's about it. It was, you know, it's about all I knew about God. Um, so starting off this journey in my Bible and reading it, Satan comes to kill so much joy, I realized real quick I got to make some major changes. I come from a broken home. Anyone else come from a broken home in here? Maybe without a father. He was there. He provided. He gave money, but he wasn't there. You know what I mean? And I got some stats that will blow your mind on our chances as men to uh, continue on without being raised by a father. With no father, a child is 500% more likely to be poor. With no father, a child is more likely to be incarcerated on substance abuse and have a teen pregnancy. 
100% more likely to drop out of school, doubles the risk of 100% increase to grow up with physical, emotional, educational neglect. And I'm not using this um, to bring anyone down, I'm actually using it as a motivation piece. And that's powerful information. <laughs> My mom, uh, was a tough woman who did everything possible to give me a normal childhood school clothes, sports uh, school, any function she worked multiple jobs to provide for us <laughs> stand up mom And she loves God. Come on. Give it a look. Told you you shouldn't have come. <laughs> you know what? I got a flower. All right. Thank you. My father, he loved me, he was super proud of me. <clears throat> but he, um, he doubted everything. Anything I ever uh, wanted to go after, he doubted, said, you know, I'll never be as big or as strong as him. I'll never be able to shoot guns like he shoots guns. You know, I'll never make as much money as him. I'll never be as tall as him. You know, and it, um, it could have been a joke. But it didn't seem like a joke, and it's, um, I wouldn't change that for the world, because that created a monster in me. All that did was fuel the fire to destroy every boundary he set for me. I destroyed it. He was also an alcoholic who missed all my sporting events, my family functions, uh, even uh, a Christmas morning. I go to school and tell him that my dad was working on Santa's sled and stuff because he wasn't home. <laughs> Drugs and alcohol ultimately consumed him and took over his life. But everything he said I couldn't do, I was completely persistent on destroying that. And I did that. I joined the Marine Corps to get some kind of leadership, guidance, challenge myself. I was a great Marine. My first class and everything. I got a Marine brother over here, which I just seen. Yeah. Uh, first class, everything. Shooting, swimming, physical fitness. You know, I, I was built for it, really. Um, I trained really hard. Um, with the most elite fighting force in the world, if you ask me. But then weekends, we party even harder. Turned all my feelings and emotions off like a switch. I just didn't want to feel anymore. So when things might happen, it didn't even bother you, you just move on, keep moving forward. I was cold and hardened. My heart was my heart was dead. You know that's why I, um, that's why I cry so much now. It's funny. I was at my mom's the other day, and she said, "Hey, bud, talking to my son, Dick Perm. <laughs> <laughs> you ever seen your daddy cry?" He's like. Pfft. Yeah, he's a baby. <laughs> and little, little does he know, that's, that's God. Amen. 
When I joined the Marine Corps, I had dreams of dying in combat zones for my country. Really didn't have college plans. You know, I really didn't take the right classes to pursue football or anything else. So I went after this Marine Corps thing with everything I had. And I had every intention on dying out there for, for you guys. They call us infidels overseas. An infidel is someone who's controlled by their senses, lives for the weekend, and doesn't have a plan for his future. I was really an infidel. And I'm proud to say that's no longer me. In training, we did missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, they were awesome. We used to do missions listening to the craziest screamish rock um, to the, the hardest rap. Um, it didn't matter. I didn't really have anything to live for other than my military brothers. Um, honestly, none of us really cared if we lived or died. We, we had each other's back for life. You know, you gotta be careful what you put in your mind because them songs are, are so much deeper than just a song. That'll get in your heart and start growing and then hate and everything else will start coming into it, you know? Just be, be careful what you're putting in your mind. You know, whether you're reading the wrong things, looking at the wrong things, or listening to the wrong things. You're, you're flirting with disaster and it can be a seed that gets planted in your heart and might grow and then the next thing you know, it's out of control in your life. I had no relationship with Jesus, but I believe God had my time, whether it was at home in a car wreck or overseas, somewhere fighting for my country. I, I slept with a rifle, you know, loud explosions every night super loud sirens going off saying you're getting attacked. Um, certain smells, noises will take me right back to Iraq or Afghanistan right now. For example, just a simple school bus. The diesel smell of the school bus will put me right in a desert. Like, literally, I'm standing there, breathing that in, I'm there. I almost have to snap myself out of it. There's so many more triggers like that. <clears throat> I met this beautiful girl who loved God. There was something about her that was bigger than, than looks. Um, she carried something that I was super attracted to that I, I wanted to know more about. Like, a glow, I guess. But there was something there that I never seen before. And she entered my life at a pivotal moment. I plan on getting down the Marine Corps where there's 22 veterans a day killing themselves because of the struggle of adapting back to civilian life. So I was either going to gamble on becoming another statistic or figure out God's grace and mercy. At that time, my life was great. I was married to my beautiful wife. But soon after returning from Afghanistan, the war didn't stop. When I got back, all kind of emotions didn't deal with, was buried that was coming back, resurfacing a lot stronger than what it was before. The surface level thing I was talking about earlier, that was me. I looked pretty, I looked good, but inside I was dying. I'd hang out with friends, they didn't have a clue.
it's important to check in on your people. If it's been a couple days, reach out to them. Even if it's some just thinking about it. Anything. That could save someone's life. I was full of anger. Everywhere I went, I was checking out my biggest threat and how to eliminate it. Even chisel. <laughs> I put my wife through so much. She didn't get that newlywed marriage. You know, um, she got someone that had dreams, nightmares, back pain, anger, depression, worry, anxiety. That's what she got. That's why the divorce rate in the military is 90 something percent. And I think the army passed the Marine Corps and it might be more than that. After going back to jail for fighting, the VA diagnosed me with PTSD. So I started VA pain medication, counseling. Thought I was doing a little better taking six to 10 Vicodin a day on top of some Prozac and some other psych meds. Realized I was just a, a zombie, numb, uh, drinking alcohol every night at bedtime. Just to go to sleep, to um, put myself at a deep sleep where the dreams wouldn't come. I'm on page three. <laughs> Fighting for my freedom <clears throat> was literally killing. Killing. Anger was controlling my life. I messed that up right there because I'm trying to read it too. Me fighting for your freedoms that people take for granted that when we come home and people are complaining about little petty stuff and are victims. <sighs> Me fighting for your freedom was killing and destroying my freedom and my relationship. Shortly after I got discharged Actually going on exactly two years. Come home from work and I deliver mail. Come home from work and my wife has the mail in her hand. Big envelope addressed to Staff Sergeant Horn. She was, looked like she'd been in a fight, eyes busted up, swollen up. She must have already read it. You're going back to our rack. So the way I dealt with that was I locked myself in a dark room for almost two days, realizing that the dream that I had of dying for my country might actually come true. I told my wife, we gotta get pregnant in case I die. I'm the only horn left. Needless to say, we were blessed. My wife was pregnant. I'm not gonna lie, I wanted a son to carry on a name and we had a daughter. So I couldn't die. My whole world changed. I couldn't be the young and reckless type of Marine anymore. I actually had responsibilities at home, things to live for, 
I promise God that if he brought me home safe, I will live for him. Since my return from Iraq, I struggled adjusting back to civilian life so bad. I was begging. I was begging God. I told you, Todd, I'll come up here like a lion and be a baby. Do y'all know what I'm trying to say? My son's here. So I'm not saying just thought my family would be better off without me. A boatload of money and a fresh start. I was surrounded by family who didn't understand things like why I need my shoes by the door, just in case. That was a fight in our house. My gosh. Around that time, I got a phone call that my dad was dead. The investigation was leaning towards suicide. He was shot in the chest with a gun with a shotgun, deer slug. When my father killed himself, I was no longer blind. At that point, God took the blinders off my eyes. I realized how selfish it was to your friends and family who love you. I started reading my Bible again and come across a couple of scriptures that set me free. Ephesians 4, 26 through 32. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work. And then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Do not bring sorrow to the God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing, guaranteeing that you will be saved on that day. That's an awesome guarantee, right? Amen. So, when redemption comes, we're guaranteed. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Ephesians 5.18 This is another one that set me free. Don't be drunk with wine. Do you want to know why? It'll ruin your life. People act like there's a gray zone in the Bible on that. They're, it's pretty clear. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen. Read Ephesians. 
Read Ephesians every day. It's six chapters. It's not real big. It'll change your life. So far, everything I've read has been out of Ephesians. <laughs> Since I gave my life to God and intentionally seek Jesus, I take no medication. No narcotics. I don't drink alcohol. I don't cuss. I sleep just fine. I'm the spiritual leader in my family and she'll get out of the way. <laughs> hey, y'all, she had to lead our home for a while. I just realized that God was for me. He's not this guy cracking a whip out of me. You know what I mean? Then we're blessed coming in, we're blessed going out. The Bible says if you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. <clears throat> so that tells me God never drew away from you. You drew away from him. Listen, God loves me. And he has given me my freedom back. Real freedom. Listen, not like the... You know, hey, I quit drinking, and you walk by the bar, and you're going, oh, man, man. Not like you quit smoking, and you're like, oh, is that a small cigarette, a small cigarette. That's torment, okay? I'm talking about real freedom. No desire. No want, no nothing. I noticed that I was a son. That was powerful to me. Sometimes it's hard when you have a daddy that don't, you know, live for God. That kind of can be an embarrassment to you at times to hear the word father is not really a, a good thing. Or, uh, you know, when you pray, father, I always thought, yeah, okay. But when you really learn, lean in and know him, he will father you. I'm a son of the Most High King. I'm more than a conqueror through the precious blood of Jesus. If he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Christianity is a spiritual combat zone. That's just the way I look at it. I have to learn things through military stuff. It's a full contact sport. You're either on this team or you're not on this team. Being good don't mean nothing. You must choose a side. And I'm asking you, I'm actually giving you a little insight to my morning routine. So I'm asking y'all to join me and fight. The right fight, the spiritual fight. Every day, Satan's trying to take ground. We must wake up on assignment. It's, it's pivotal. If you're going through the motions, you're not on the right team. Be intentional in your Bible. All right. I better leave that alone. This is my morning most motivational video right here. seem unmovable, when defeat seems absolutely inescapable, and retreat seems like your only logical option. I want you to remember it is always too soon to quit. Say that with me. It is always too soon to quit. 
Christopher Marley said, and I quote, someone who is a big shot is only a little shot who kept on shooting. Persistence is a fire in your bones that will carry you through ridicule, that will carry you through rejection and reversal. Persistence does not need public approval. Persistence does not need a slap on the back. Persistence could care less about being politically correct. Persistence says, in faith, mountain, get out of my way. Persistence says, nothing is impossible to those that believe. Persistence says, if God be for you, who can be against you? Persistence says, the victory is ours through Christ the Lord. Persistence says, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Persistence says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Persistence looks at 10,000 coming against you from every direction as King David and says, though a host should encamp against me, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. You're looking at the winner here. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Give him praise and glory in the house. Quit living life looking in the rear view mirror. Quit looking at the mistakes of yesterday and say it prohibits me from being all I can be today. Every page in this book says press on, endure, fight back, win, for greater is he that is within you than he that's within the world. Fight back. You're a child of God. The royal blood of heaven is flowing in your veins. God does not sponsor flops and he does not manufacture junk. You are a child of the Most High God. You're going to stand in the winner's circle. You're not going to be the victim. You're going to be the victor because Christ is Lord over your situation. Only believe all things are possible for you. Never give up. Never, 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 never give up. Stay at it. If you reach the end of your rope, tie a knot in it and hang on. If you get whipped, go home and lick your wounds and come out the next day and fight to win again. This book says nothing is impossible with you. If you believe that, that one verse will transform your mind in your life. This book says greater is he, meaning the Holy Spirit that is in you, than he that is within the world. This book says if God be for us, who can be against us? This book says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This book says let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. If we faint not, that means press on, that means endure, that means God cannot fail and you're not going to give up. That's not an option for a child of God. This means you are going to be the Listen to this and write it down if you can't remember it. You're never going to outgrow warfare. You simply must learn to fight. I hear people saying to me all the time, oh, when is it going to get easier? When you die. Warfare is a normal New Testament Christian posture. Get used to it. You ready to go to war now? Yeah. You ready to fight the right fight? Sometimes you have to shout. <laughs> no lie, I'm delivering milk. I'm going through houses. And uh, I just, I feel this thing, like just jump on me almost. Like it was just like a boom, depression. And I was like, man, no way, man. I just got off an awesome uh, encounter and then in between the house I said hey it left me <laughs> and then I called my boss and said hey that was me yelling anyone calls in <laughs> I just had to handle some stuff Listen, I'm telling you guys jokes and stuff to get you giggling because I personally know of a great person, more than one, who has lost his battle to addiction.
I personally had a roommate of mine in the Marine Corps ultimately commit suicide. And I'm sick and tired of it. I pray for Backpack and his crew. I can name people, Blevins, I don't know, they're all on just an all-star team. Because I'm a firefighter in Gas City too. My pager goes off relentlessly. A possible overdose, unresponsive. And I'm sick of it. I'm not congested anymore. Thank you, Lord. I receive it. I'm just so sick of addiction. Overdoses, depression, PTSD, suicidal thoughts. I say to hell with it. Yeah, I said hell in church. Because all of us are going to come after it. The way we come after it is by living our life in a way that people can't stand. Your light shines so bright, people can't stand it. Okay? Yeah. So after that video, I had a lot of people who've been hollering about joining me. First thing we do when we wake up, matter of fact, I'm still laying down in bed and I'm talking to God. So when my feet hit the ground, I already been talking to my daddy. And then I go in my living room or go where my wife's not because we wake up at the same time now. So kind of puts a kink in where I go because she beats me there. And then you go, you start your day like this and get in your word. I don't care if it's for five minutes or five hours, start somewhere. I'm about that. But listen, we, we encounter broken people every single day who are begging, who are walking around completely empty. And like Nathan Harmon said last week, they're filling that void with the counterfeit. They're smashing needles in their arms and they're taking pills and they're chewing on patches and stuff. That void is supposed to be for the Holy Ghost. Get rid of the counterfeit. It's not women. It's not money. It's not cars. It's not anything this world can give you. Because I promise you, you get what you want, now it's old and you don't even care. You get the house you really have to have and then really maintain it, it's a lot more what you think. I'm seriously cool to sell everything I got and live in a trailer. She's not. So after you get up off your knees and 
get your breakfast or whatever. The next thing you must do is surround yourself with like-minded people who are on the same path or are running after God and you want what they have. I don't care if you and me have nothing in common and you come up to me and say, dude, I love computers. I'm going to say, I'm not your dude. But he says, you know what else I love? I love Jesus, man. And I want to get around a group of dudes that will sit around and take care of each other and love each other. I'll say, I got you. Let's meet up Monday. Don't matter who they are, what they bring to the table. They're not all going to be athletes. They're not all going to be computer guys. They're not all going to be, you know, a certain type of person. But when we all get together, we're on or unstoppable. Man, can I, I'm going to do one more testimony. And I don't know if I'm going to get through. And I'll probably mess it up. But I challenge you guys to live on assignment. I'm going to try to give you an example of that, okay? In this testimony. God just threw this on me, so, um, give me grace. Remember, I'm a Marine. I'm a firefighter. At the same time. <laughs> I was involved in a uh, weird um, devastating accident in Atlanta. And um, we seen a motorcycle collide with a car. We see a lady go flying. We see the guy go flying. The car stopped. I told my wife, hey, you call my mom right now and just go ahead and tell him, you better send your best over because this is a paramedic, you know, might need to send a helicopter. Um, she ran over to the vehicle uh, of the, the people driving the vehicle, not the motorcycle. I run over to the motorcycle. I see the lady in the middle of the road and I'm just assessing everything. I'm in the darkest highway in Atlanta, Georgia. Matter of fact, I guess everyone has a wreck on this road. It's pitch black. I run over and I see the passenger. Can I go here, man? Yeah, you can go here. Right? I see the passenger. Legs are gone. Bones are sticking out. Blood everywhere. And I said, Sit tight, like she was going to go somewhere. <laughs> Dumb in the moment. I sprint over to her husband. His legs folded up behind his head. But he's going to be all right. I can tell it's multiple compound fractures in his leg. And he's, he's probably going to live unless the femur hits something crazy. But I didn't see nothing. So I tell him, he's off the road and in the grass and in a ditch. I tell him, hey, you're, you're good. You're fine. People are coming. I already called everyone and I stopped the vehicle to hit you, so we're good. Because he was screaming, did you get the mother? I said, yes, I did. Just relax and 
and don't try to do none, just stay there. I immediately go back to the wife and I'm thinking, tourniquet. She needs a tourniquet. I'm in basketball shorts. I don't have nothing. I don't have nothing. I'm processing. How am I going to get this lady's blood to stop? So I'm running around looking for anything I can think of. People are coming up, asking me how to help. I say, you know what, go find the legs. I'm missing two legs, I need the legs. Stop traffic. I mean, I'm trying to deal with this lady. I got a teeny tiny little flashlight trying to get dudes flying in a highway like, whoa, 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 because she's in the middle of the road. So we pulled the truck out and we got it all lit up, trying to get some sights in there, but I assess everything, and I had nothing for this lady. I had nothing. In the world, in the world, I had nothing to give this lady. I mean, I'm seriously thinking. I'm gonna rip my shirt off. I'm gonna go Rambo, and I'm just gonna start tying it on there thinking it's gonna work. It's not gonna work. A tourniquet needs to stay in place and be not movable for the, for the bleeding to be stopped and successful. I hear the ambulances coming and stuff. <laughs> so I know they're real close. I run over to the truck, talk to my wife, check in on her. Make sure my kids are facing this way. They're in the truck with me. And uh, my wife has this look. This just determined, like, almost like fire in her eyes look. She said, Tim, you don't understand. I gotta go pray for them. And I said, no way. It's bad. I don't want you to see this stuff. But you know what? I've seen a look in her I've never seen before. And I said, you know what? Here's the lowdown. The guy on the motorcycle's way over there. He's in the grass. He's good. His legs bowed over his head. He's, he's ready to fight you, but he can't move. The woman, both her legs are gone. Bones are sticking out. Blood's going everywhere. And she's wide awake talking. Like awkwardly. Like asking me for her inhaler. Full shock. I've never seen shock like this before in someone. So I have nothing in the medical field, in the self-care, buddy care, and uh, and how can I help this lady to hold on just a second longer for them to show up? I have nothing to give this lady. I wasn't living on assignment. You see what I'm getting at? The lady passed away. When my wife was on assignment. She said, do you know Jesus? Come on. Yeah. Yeah, I do. She said, okay, I'm with you. Don't video my face. 
We're taking pictures. Listen, <laughs> my wife was the last person, to my knowledge, yeah. with a conscience, with knowing what was going on. She was very sharp, very clear in her mind. My wife was the last person she seen, and my wife was talking to her about Jesus. That's what I mean by living on assignment, guys. You never know. You don't know what it looks like. It's not an inconvenience. I'm late everywhere I go, and the excuse is not, hey, I was praying for somebody. So let's choose to live seeing through God's eyes. On assignment, you don't know whose life you're going to save. You don't know who you're passing by. You don't know who you're going to pass by. They might be thinking, you know what, man, this, this struggle, the transition of this life is too much. I don't know where you guys are at. I do want you to know that the freedom that I have over the things that were set up to destroy me, the generational curses that were set out to destroy me with uh, women, drugs, alcohol. I started looking into that stuff, it's real. My dad had multiple women. My grandpa's had multiple women. They both struggled with alcohol. And I don't know my great grandpa, but there's a pattern developing. So I challenge you to kind of dig deep. This is deep. You all probably should have been gone an hour ago. I don't know. But I feel like this is something that you guys need to hear. Look at the things that were set up to destroy your daddy and his daddy. I have my son here. So proud of him. He'll, he'll never know that. He'll never know what that feels like. I'm missing my daughter. She's out running around doing girl, 13 year old shopping stuff. She's cool. Disco. <laughs> but really dig into your dig into your past as men. Know your worth. Dig into your past. You're gonna know what's set up to destroy your life. Fight the right fight. Get in this every morning. My brother Jeremy back there thought I was crazy at first when I met him. I said I get up an hour early before work every time, man, every day. Yeah, I'm watching what my kids are watching. Yeah, my son likes WWE. There's a lot of demonic stuff on WWE. Oh, he only talks to the dead, the Undertaker. I mean, that's cool, man. I mean, I get it. But you gotta be very careful what you're putting in here. This is not a trash can. This is not a trash can. Plant the right seeds in your heart so the right things in your life grow up. I get the honor and privilege. To my knowledge, all these dudes over here are my brothers. To my knowledge, we're all that first generation, if I'm not mistaken. We might have had a grandma standing in the gap, but I have the honor and the privilege to see my brother Todd out here. His daddy was the first one. 
and I get to see how Todd lives his life, which AKA, he's my pastor. And he's my pastor because he lives it, breathes it, we go on vacation together, that's who he is. And I pray for him all the time because I know he's got so much more of an attack on his life because of what he's doing. He's, he, um, I'll leave it alone. There's a lot of dudes in here in our men's group that he's setting free. But when I look at Todd Dog, I get to think of my son, my daughter. It's important. A lot of people are living not seeing pastors live the right life. Not seeing men that claim Christianity living wrong. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's grace there. God will deal with that stuff, but if I go after you real hard and talk about how God is so good to me and then you see me at Applebee's with a pint of beer, you ain't gonna believe a word I say. So it has to go. Live your life on assignment. Dig into your past a little bit. Don't offend no one. Listen, I love the horn man. I love the horn man. My grandpa goes to church now. You know what I'm saying? My dad don't get that opportunity. But I will never disgrace the horn man. No matter how many times I sit up here and bawl like a little baby and talk about the horns got all these generational curses you're dumb if you think you don't have one you're dumb if you don't realize when you're born they ain't even got the, the goo off your body yet that baby is immediately getting attacked and getting bent with the proclivity of a generational curse Goo goo gaga. And there's little things in there that are passed down from generation to generation that are set up to destroy my son's life. And I stand right here by the power <coughs> of Jesus. That my son will not deal with anything that I had to deal with. Because I will fight the right fight, on assignment, on a mission, and I'll fight that every day of my life. I'll beat him down to the ground till he dies. Because them chains are broken off me, son. So you're free from them. You understand that? Take pride in that. Don't let people at school say, man, you got a perfect family, and you got this and that. No, take pride in that. You got something special, you're called to be something great. <laughs> Last but not least, if any of y'all got hit in the heart with anything I said about freedom, about real freedom, and about it being available, I invite you to come up. It takes a lot of courage to do so. I got Johnny backpack. He's got a crew up here. They'll pray that right off of you. Listen, it's real. It takes a lot of courage. I get it. It's tough. I'm going to give you a little bit more time because I don't want you to walk out of here regretting that you didn't do it. Johnny. Amen. Courageous. You guys are warriors, man. You're warriors. Real freedom is in the house tonight. Amen.
Come up here, Cody. Cruz. These are mighty men of God coming up here. I know them personally.